Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me. As usual, I'm taking on some of these complex topics around uh, unusual patterns that have come through research. And what I'll be focusing on today is a paper that had recently been published in the BMJ, which was effectively highlighting that COVID vaccines protect against clots. This is the um, the paper it was just published, and I'll go through that in just a minute. Um, and that caught my attention because um, for anyone who knows what I've been focusing on recently, I'm trying to figure out why we have embalmer's clots post-mortem. And there's a real possibility that it could be tied to this elephant in the room. And so I was very surprised when I saw that paper. And so I had to think carefully and try and look and make sense of some of the data. So I'll try and take you through my thoughts. The link is in the description and you can look at it yourself. Just on another point, if you are very interested in looking at the um, this here, Abnormal Physiology in the Vaccinated Heart, the link is in the description. This is a course with a discount and we would like you to learn more about some of the concerns that I have over time and the risk to the population. I, I want to make something clear because people don't seem to quite get this. Uh, some people may consider that when I'm speaking about these things that I am just focused on criticizing the um, the rollout and the um, the approach that has been taken in the pandemic. It's not quite right. I recognize where there is benefit. I recognize where there is risk. What I'm most concerned about is risk because there doesn't seem to be enough attention from the scientific community about longer term potential risks. So let's get back to some of the data, see if I can try and share with you my thoughts. Now, remember, I'm not a statistician. I'm just a clinician. And from a clinical point of view, I know when things don't quite add up. And so when they don't add up, I think, what is it that I'm missing? And I will try and see if you can get what I think was important about this paper. So the first thing that you have to know, as I said, this paper was published in um, just about a, a week ago. I'm looking for the date on, on this here, um, just to make sure that we, we get it. But it was just, just published. Involved the University of Oxford, Spain, and Estonia. So it was quite a large study. And let me see if I can make it a bit bigger so that you can see it. Oops. There we go. Yeah, so that's easier for you to read here. So this is a study, quite a big study, and they were looking at COVID vaccination versus the unvaccinated and the risk of post-COVID-19 cardiac and thromboembolic complications. Now, that's the first thing that caught me out because I didn't notice the post. I just saw the preventing COVID-19 thromboembolic and cardiovascular complications. This post is extremely important. What it's not talking about is that it's not saying that it prevents complications, because this is my first thought. What do you mean? We are looking at thromboembolic complications um, around vaccines. So why would it say that? No, it's specifically talking about post-COVID. And I'll take you through what the study was looking at. And it, it was quite a, a big study. I'll show you here again. This is showing that it was looking at technically 10.17 million vaccinated and 10.39 million unvaccinated. Now, it's a complex study. And this is why I said a statistician would have to look at it to identify if there are any statistical flaws in it, because they staggered when people were shifted from unvaccinated to vaccinated. I don't quite fully understand how they got the 10.39 million unvaccinated, because you would have some shifting across where people got vaccinated. How do you break that out? That's where the statistics comes in, and it requires somebody to really dig through it. As I said, I'm looking at this from a clinical point of view. And so I'm going to share some important points. Uh, 
This is essentially what they were doing. They were looking at this time frame here. Either date zero was where they had the vaccine. I think this was from the first vaccine, not necessarily the second vaccine, or day X from COVID infection. And then they were looking at different time frames. This is the acute, 30 days. Then you have 30 to 90 days, which is post-acute, 90 to 180 days, and then 180 days to 365 days. They were looking at conditions like myocarditis, hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke, myocardial infarction, TIAs. So all the thromboembolic complications that you can have around the uh, pandemic. So this is what they were focused on. So as I said, this was a big study. And the most important thing that then made sense to me, and I'll share this with you, is that you now have to understand about the timing of it. And so here is in the paper where they did this bit. This is a multinational network staggered cohort study. And so, as I said, they were looking at the four staggered cohorts. They are looking at over 75, over 65, I think over 55, and then below that. Um, and what they did here, the source population comprised all adults registered in the respective database for at least 180 days from the start of the study. Now, this is where it's important. 4th of January, 2021, as for one part of the study, 20th of February, 2021, and the 28th of January, 2021. So they were looking at a time frame from early 2021 to early 2022. Really, really important because that's a historical view. That is not real world at the moment because all of that was primarily covering the Delta wave. And for those who don't remember, the Delta wave was a serious wave. It was probably the most lethal part of the COVID pandemic was the Delta virus when it spread. If you remember what happened in India, then it spread across the world. At the end of 2021, in December, was the beginning of Omicron. And Omicron didn't start circulating until about um, January to May 2022. So this would not have included the Omicron bit. This was technically looking at the alpha um, uh, variant, the delta variant, and seeing what occurred with it. So as I said, it's still useful information, but it is not what is valuable today. We need to understand what is happening with Omicron. So just to show you what they found with regards to the Delta wave is what they found was that there was protection. And so wherever you see this line here, that's the one point. And that's what you would call almost a zero line. And so there is protection beyond here on this side and higher risk on this side. And you can see across the board, there seems to be protection for all these conditions in the context of the vaccinated who got COVID. That's a really important point, the vaccinated who got COVID. And as I said, in the context of the Delta wave, if you had somebody who was unvaccinated and got the Delta variant, I wouldn't be surprised that they were at higher risk of some of these things here. But you can see that over the time frame, from the first 30 days, this is early in January, February to March, well, January, February, then all the way to the last half of the year going into the Omicron wave, a lot of those benefits seem to disappear across all of the different conditions. And this is just about COVID infection. So, I thought that this um, image here would be also very useful for you to understand what it looks like. So I'll share with you this image here. And this was, again, a breakdown as to what it would look like, how they would select somebody. So you have here in this, blue is the vaccine. This red is the COVID infection. And this in blue with a plus sign, is uh, the 
thromboembolic event, whether or not it was a DVT, an MI, or a stroke, whatever. If this is the vaccinated cohort, this is the unvaccinated cohort, okay? So the unvaccinated cohort is in green. And you can see in the unvaccinated cohort here, and again, let me just get it a little bit bigger. So as you can see in the unvaccinated cohort here, um, getting it up, you can then see here the point that they started or they were registered. This is where they had an infection. This person then had a vaccine later on. This person here was registered, then had an infection, then had a thromboembolic event. And you can see going through here, this person here would have had infection, event, infection, event. And this is all, therefore, in the early part of 2021. What is interesting is when you look at the vaccinated cohort, for one, when you look at these little red dots scattered through with infection and events, it doesn't seem to be a huge advantage. You hear vaccinated, infection, event, further infection, further vaccine, further event. This person vaccinated, two events, then two infections, then an event. This person vaccinated, had an event, then had an infection, then had another event. And you can see that this, again, as I said, is in early 2021. So it's still useful to know from a historical point of view, but it is not necessarily that practical with helping us to understand where we are at the moment. Because, as I said, one of the things that you're seeing there is the risk of vaccination, infection, thromboembolic event, further um, further infection, increasing that risk. That's what we're seeing. And here's another important point that I'd want to highlight, that uh, you end up with these sides, people who says there is no benefit to vaccination, and then the others who said everybody should be vaccinated. I think both groups are wrong. In the middle, and I want you to think carefully about this. Look at this group here. They are unvaccinated. They had two episodes of infection in close proximity to each other and then had some events. I would bet that if we did the blood tests on this group here, you would find that they had interferon autoantibodies. These are the people who are at high risk for severe disease. These are the people who you hear about, oh goodness, they were so fit and well, and then they had severe COVID and they died. Interferon autoantibodies is what they were finding because it's preventing the immune system from responding quickly enough to the infection. That cohort would definitely benefit from being vaccinated, certainly at that time. Now, if they already had an infection and they pass through the infection, I still am yet to be convinced that hybrid immunity can be more effective than natural immunity unless somebody may have interferon autoantibodies. That's where potentially we have a cohort and we would have been much better off trying to identify who those people were and working to mitigate their risk around infection. This is probably the way we should have been thinking about it from the start. That's what happens when politics gets involved in science. And I would like to caution my audience that please don't get stuck on ideology. An ideology says that the vaccines are all bad. Ideology says the vaccines are all good. Try and be nuanced. Understand, because that's how medicine works. Medicine is about identifying risk, using strategies that will mitigate risk, and trying to protect people. Once you do something across the board, you're almost guaranteed that you're increasing the risk for the whole population. So that's where my stance is. Now, when I look back at the paper, and this is the point that I'm making, is that when I look back at the paper, I then understand where they're coming from. And in summary, what they're saying is this. In the context of the end of the alpha wave and the delta wave, 
there was a cohort of people who, when they were vaccinated, had a lower risk of thromboembolic and cardiovascular complications after they got a COVID-19 infection. And you have to remember that some of these people may have had severe COVID, and this is what could have happened in the unvaccinated, well, to an extent in the vaccinated cohort as well. But that's what it's looking at, the post-COVID-19 period, over the period of time where we had Delta. So this information, as I said, is still valuable, but it is not going to help us to understand what are the risks with regards to thromboembolic events around recurrent um, infections with Omicron plus vaccination, whether or not somebody is vaccinated, recurrent infection seems to have a risk. That's where we still have a lot more research to do. But don't get distracted. There are some serious issues ahead that we have to figure out. And my point is that these kinds of papers must be nuanced, not to lull the population into a false sense of security. No, there are some serious problems that need to be addressed and need to be understood around excess deaths, around the point that I'm making with regards to these strange clots that are being seen. The, st the story is not going away. And so we still have to figure all of this out. And politics and trying to position themselves around this does not help at all. So again, as I remind everyone, try and be nuanced. Try and be balanced in your thinking. Don't get caught up in the politics. Let's always focus on trying to find solutions. Have a great evening.